going so wonderfully. Are you ready for the word? All right, go with me to Galatians 7, 6, 7 through 10. Thank you. Somebody's always ready helping me preach. Help me. Galatians 6. Galatians is written by Paul. There is some debate about whether Paul wrote some other books in the Bible, but there is no debate about whether or not Paul is the author of Galatians. Galatians is, is now sitting where we know Turkey to sit. Galatians is a, one of the first churches that, that Paul created, and he found them in a state of sliding back into some of the legalistic beliefs uh, that were taught to the Jews. And he, he was coming to talk to them about not turning their backs on what Christ had done for them. So this whole book is about giving them strength and giving them power. Amen? All right, you should be there. I, I, I did all that for you, okay? All right, all right. Galatians 6, 7 through 10, read it with me. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whatsoever so, whosoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whosoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Hallelujah. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, somebody say at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people. Let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, as you take your seat, I need you to turn to your neighbor. And I need you to look them dead in the eye. Now, turn to your neighbor because, you know, I can see you up here. I can see you. Turn to your neighbor and put a title on this message for me and say, it's on the way. Woo! Now, turn to your other neighbor. And declare it again. Say, it's on the way. Say it like me. It's on the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the way. It's on the way. Now, some of you, some of you are not quite sure why we're shouting already. And you're saying, what's on the way? What is it? For the purpose of this message... It is anything that you need, desire, want. It is your harvest coming in. <laughs> your it might be your children's success, your career success. Your it might be just the power to condemn every lying tongue that rose against you. Your it might be a roof replacement. Favor with a claims adjuster. A loan officer. Your it might be the need for a healing for your knee, your toe, your back, your head, your blood pressure, your diabetes, your cancer, your thyroid, your lungs, your liver, your digestive system. It might even be relief from constipation. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. Oh, yeah, there's been time I've said, oh, Lord, on the throne. Oh, Lord, bring forth. Okay. Your it might just be strength to endure or the courage to move out of that relationship with that boyfriend or girlfriend that you know it ain't heaven sent. Your it just might be a need for a little peace in the midst of the hell that you're going through. We all have an it, amen? I don't know what your it is, 
but I'm confident that if you will do what he has instructed us to do, your it is on the way. Your it is on the way. Growing up, I learned not to panic when my mother did not arrive back to pick me up at the conclusion of an event. You know, I was one of those child children that were still there when everybody else was gone. I didn't have a phone because we didn't have phones back then. So she couldn't text me to tell me that she was on the way. I just had to wait. And I knew that there was no sense in crying because I tried that. That, that, that didn't bring her there no faster. And I had the smarts not to draw attention to myself because if I had, she gave me some attention when she got there. Now, you see, I am the 10th of 11 children. I could have easily just given up. I mean, I'm 10th. She got 10 more. But I had enough history with my mother that I knew that while she may not come when I want her, she was definitely on her way. So I would continue to look for her. And while the wait seemed like eternity, when you're waiting, it seems like eternity, doesn't it? I had enough faith in her not to give up. I would stand, I, I, I would pace, but, but I had enough history to know that she indeed was on her way. In her 1970 Chevrolet Impala, I was so happy when that green car came around the corner just like you are so happy when our wait is over. Is that right? So why is it that some of us can trust our earthly parents, but we fail to trust our heavenly father to provide for us our needs, our wants, our desires, our it. Some of us treat God like a deadbeat father, you know, the kind that won't pay his child support. The kind that, the kind of parent that he or she uh, says they're going to come pick up the child but never shows up. But do I have a witness that our father is not a deadbeat father? In fact, he's the best father in the world. And he always shows up. Is that right? In verse 7, Paul reminds us of who God is. Sometimes we need to be reminded of who God is. Is that right? When he writes, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Uh, allow me to put that in another vernacular. Don't get it twisted. Don't let nobody lie to you. Our God is no joke. He is real. He is authentic. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He is who he says he is, and he should not be treated like he was worthless, weak, and powerless. Amen? Amen. But for some reason, when it comes to our it, we forget who he is. And if it's opposed to bringing our it to him, we try to handle it ourselves. We say, you know, God, I got this. Right? And before you know it, we got a mess on our hands. Is that right? Is that right? You and I have a history with a father that loves us. We know we can trust him for he has shown up time after time after time, right on time. Is that right? Now, I'd imagine, I'd imagine that some of you have your own testimony. Is that right? I'd imagine that there's some, some of you who, who know something about our God and who he is and what he does. Is that right? Let's see, let's see, let's see. If you've ever been in a tough situation, and you knew it was nothing but God that brought you through. <laughs> Wave your head and say thank you. You know those times where you got yourself into something you should not have even been into. And he came and rescued you. 
<laughs> if you've ever been told that you couldn't get something, and they told you that there was no way to get it, and they told you that there was no way they were going to get it to you, you ever been there, and God came and made a way out of no way, you ought to jump on your feet and say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! If you've ever told God to heal your body or you ask him to heal your child's body or your friend's body and you stand today healed because he's Jehovah Jireh, you ought to just say thank you. Thank you. If you've ever taken a test and you know you shouldn't have passed it, but by the grace of God you passed it, just say thank you. If you've ever been stranded, you ever been stranded somewhere and, and didn't know how you was going to get there, you know, your gas ran out. You know what I'm saying? And somebody came by and picked you up because God sent them and just say thank you. Thank you. Do you know him as a good God? Say thank you. Amen. But now that we've shouted about how he's able, let me ask you a question. What makes us doubt it? What makes us doubt that God is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do? Now, there's some people say, I don't doubt him. Uh, I mean, we have all the evidence that tells us that we have no reason to doubt him. Is that right? We know Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We know that's true. Is that right? But what makes us doubt him? Allow me to give you one answer. Just like God has a plan for your life, so does Satan. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan to steal, kill, and destroy everything that you have. Amen? For if Satan can activate his plan, he can make sure that you never get what God intended for us to get. Is that right? So he's always providing you evidence that what you need or want is not on the way. It's his greatest trick. He, said, he shows you that this is not coming because he makes one bad thing happen. And then another bad thing happens. You, you know what I'm talking about? And then another bad thing happens. Is that right? And before you know it, you stop looking. You stop looking for what God has promised you. The ultimate plan Satan has is to counsel out your blessing, your it, using your own doubt. His plan is to make us doubt that God is real and willing to provide for our needs and our desires. Satan is fully aware that without faith you can't please him. He's fully aware, see he knows the word, that you can't get no reward if you doubt him. He's fully aware that the mountain that stands in your way gets to keep standing as a stopper to your blessing if you just doubt him. Satan is fully aware without faith. <laughs> we can't use the power that God has given us to speak to the mountain and say, go to the sea and believe it's going and watch it go down without faith. Amen? You see, God has given us power to speak life over our circumstances and our situations. You got a circumstance right now, is that right? You got a situation right now, is that right? You have power to speak over that situation. Life, all you got to do with that situation or that circumstance that you got is tell God about it. Is that right? But Satan, Satan's got a different plan. He, he wants you to speak death to, our, to your circumstance. He wants us to speak death to our situations. He wants us to say stuff like, it ain't never going to get right. You ain't going to be right till you laying in the casket. Is that right? It ain't never going to happen. You ain't never going to get that. I ain't never going to get to go there. Is that right? Satan finds joy 
when we stop believing that our blessings are on the way. Somebody say it's on the way. But James 4 and 7 provides us a method to disrupt Satan's every plan. For it tells us, submit ourselves to God. Here's the plan. You getting it? You getting it? Submit ourselves to God. What? Resist. Resist. And he will flee. See, we, we can put Satan on the run. But we've got to resist his plan. Somebody say resist. When we refuse to resist and we do what Satan's plan is for our lives, our it is put in a holding pattern. You ever been on a plane and they said we're in a holding pattern? You can see the destination, but you can't get there because you're in a holding pattern. Are you with me? Are you with me? God cannot deliver all that he has for us when we are disobedient and allowing Satan's plan to be activated. So, if you curse him or her out, even if they need it, oh, some people, they need it, don't they? But you got to have Satan use his own people to do that because they do that really well. Is that right? If you curse somebody out, you're not resisting. You are not resisting. Satan wins. You lose. All you have to do is say, God, close my mouth or give me words that are pleasing to you to make the confrontation. Is that right? If you lie. People, okay, I can't tell you how many people are sitting up here saying, I don't do that. I can see it all over. Just lying right now, right? If you lie, even a little bitty lie, a little bitty lie is a lie. Amen? A dressed up lie is a lie. Amen? Amen? Even if you lie a little bit, Satan wins. You lose. Amen? All you got to do is ask God to give you the method. The method to tell the truth, even if it's going to cost you. Because if it costs you, he'll replace it in the name of Jesus. From time to time, from time to time, my husband Lyle scolds me when we're in the grocery store because I uh, sample the fruit. And uh, I do that with Without getting permission, I just pick the grape. I got to find out if it's sweet. I mean, how am I supposed to know? It's sweet, right? And, 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 and what he said is, you don't own that grape. And you shouldn't be taking them people's grapes. You see, they sell it by the pound. You done messed up the pound. I, I, I've seen people stand there and eat several grapes, okay? They, they ain't testing, they eating, right? And so I would say to him, come on, man, everybody test the fruit. Everybody sin it. Everybody stealing. If you steal the fruit, you didn't resist. And so now when I'm in the grocery store, I always ask the people, can I taste your fruit? Because my husband's going to be all over me. If I don't ask and I steal the fruit just because everybody else is doing it. It's not a sign that you and I should be participating in it. Is that right? Is that right? Just because everybody is shaking their booty. Come on, Kathy. Come on, Kathy. I'm going to preach now. Just because they do it don't mean you should be doing it. Is that right? Is that right? It ain't holy, y'all. It ain't holy. It ain't nothing holy. Are you with me? He wins, you lose. If you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not resisting. He wins, you lose. Are you with me? Say somebody, it's on the way. So what must we do? What must we do to ensure our it, our harvest is on the way? 
first, we must plant our it. Take a look at Galatians 7b. A man reaps what he sows. He reaps what he sows. Oftentimes when we use this portion of the scripture as a threat, especially as Christians, you've, you've heard it used this way, you're going to reap what you sow. Is that right? You so going to reap what you keep on, keep on. Is that right? But just like you can reap negatively, if you will sow using your spirit, man, God promises in Malachi 3 that he would open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you wouldn't have room enough to receive it. You got any room? I got some room. You got any room? Yeah. Then we got to plant this blessing. But the whole notion of sowing indicates that you must put some sweat equity into bringing your it into full fruition. Are you with me? You see, you've got to do something. You see, oftentimes we say, I prayed about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See, see, prayer is a two-way conversation. When you pray, God talks back to you. And when he talks back to you, when you're in real relationships with you, he begins to map out the plan for you to get what you are looking for. But if you never listen, if you're not in a real relationship, you can't hear the plan. And if you can't hear the plan... You can't get it. Is it. Are you with me? You need to hear the plan. And he tells the plan in all kinds of ways. Sometimes he tells it to you. Sometimes he tells somebody else and they tell it to you, right? Sometimes a situation will tell it to you. Are you with me? Are you? But you've got to work. You've got to work using your skills, your gifts, your talents that he's given you to make it go down. These seeds cannot grow if they're never planted. Is that right? Is that right? I see a chef over there, my chef friend. Now, he can sprinkle these mustard seeds on some stuff. Is that right? And that'll make some stuff happen, right? But it ain't gonna grow nothing in the name of Jesus. Right? Right? Is that right? So the reality is, unplanted seeds are, represent real wishes. That's all they are. Real unplanted seeds sound something like, I sure wish I had a better job. I sure wish I could start a business. I sure wish I could retire comfortably. I sure wish my head would stop hurting. I sure wish I looked like her in that dress. I sure wish they would stay out of my business. I sure wish my husband could cook, but watch out. You got to clean the kitchen when they cook. I sure wish is not planting. It is the ultimate demonstration of a lack of faith. I show wish is an acknowledgement that what I want or what I desire cannot happen. So I'm not going to even make an effort to tell God about it. I show wish. Don't do nothing for God. Is that right? A wish is just a seed that is not planted. Owning this seed, this it, this wish requires no work, but planting it requires work. Somebody say you got to work. The spiritual planting process requires us first to have a well-cultivated relationship with our Father. How many of you know people, how many of you know people who only pray when something bad didn't happen? Uh, they only talk to God when they're in need. How many of you know them? How many? How many of you know what I'm talking about? People are keeping their hands down because that's them, but that's okay. Now, 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 you know what this feels like. Tell the truth, Kathy. Okay. You know what it feels like because you've got people in your life, children, nieces, nephews, friends, uncles, who don't never call you. Is that right? They'll never stop by and pay a visit. You can be sick in the hospital and they never show up. Is that right? But all of a sudden, you'll look at your phone and their name pops up. And all you can think about is what? 
What do they want? Yeah, preach for me. What do they want? Because you know, you know they want something from you. Because they never call on you until they want something. Is that right? If the only time we call on the Father is when we need his help, we are not planting our it in a well-cultivated relationship with him. And just like you're not moved to help, and you show sure enough, if you help, you show sure enough ain't going to do more than they ask. Is that right? But I got a God that if you're in relationship with, he'll do more than what you ask. Amen? I need him to do more than what I ask. In Hebrews, in Hebrews, he tells us that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Don't make a mistake here. You can't fool God. He said he can't be mocked, right? You can't fool God with your long prayer when you're drowning in a cesspool of life. He's looking for your constant worship. He's looking for a real relationship. He's looking to communicate with you frequently in all times. He says, pray without ceasing. He wants to be with you all the time. He's looking for a committed relationship. A committed relationship. Women, you, some of you, you, you know what I'm talking about. You know those men. You know, they want to come by and kiss on a little bit. And then you say, what, 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 what is this? Well, what we got going here? And, and they say, uh, we friends. We friends. Right, 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 right. Right, right, right. You're not interested in a friend. You're interested in a committed relationship. Is that right? You ain't got time for that, right? God wants a committed relationship. He moves on our behalf because we are living as he has commanded us. He moves on our behalf because we're willing to fulfill his purpose. He moves on our behalf because it's not a one-sided relationship that he does all the giving and you do all of the getting. Is that right? Matthew 6, tells us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all other things you're it. If you seek what he tells you first, if you do what he asks you, his righteousness first, your it is what? It's on the way. It's on the way. Just like natural seeds must be planted in a good, warm environment, a full relationship with our Heavenly Father provides us living water and envelops us in the warmth of the Holy Spirit so that our it can arrive. Amen? Amen? Once you're in a real relationship with God, then you're ready to plant. You're ready to plant whatever you need or desire by simply asking him for what you want. When you ask him for what you want, remember you are talking to God who delights in giving his people the desires of their hearts. Asking for small things is fine. That's fine. That's fine. You know, I've told y'all on occasion when I go to the hairdresser, I say, Lord, don't let them mess up. That's fine. Right? That's fine. That's, that's not a problem. He, he, he's down with that. He, he's, right? Right? But why ask for bus fare when you can get a car? Is that right? Why work for the man when you can work for you? Is that right? Is that right? Look at your neighbor and say, is your it big enough? Is your it big enough? About 27 years ago, about 27 years ago, Lyle and I wanted to buy a Corvette. But we got twins instead. And so we had to buy a minivan. And every time I drove up, drove up you know, by a bank where you could see yourself in that minivan... I was like, Lord, have mercy. That's me, right? And uh, 27 years, we waited 
we prayed because I wanted a sports car. That was my it. You hear what I'm saying? A couple of weeks ago, I got my it. I, I, I didn't get a Corvette. I got a Mercedes convertible. He's able. Yeah. He's able. And every time I look at it, I just say, every time I look at it, I say, look at you, God. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you. Look at you just showing up and showing out. Because he's able. Because if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. Is that right? Some of y'all ain't clapping. Don't hate. Don't hate. Don't hate. Don't hate. You got to put the time in. You got to tell God about it. You got to keep looking. You got to keep looking. You got to not give up. You got to keep looking. Don't hate. Don't hate. Celebrate. Hallelujah. 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 There are some things that are not reasonable for me to ask another human, but there is nothing. Do you hear me? There is nothing. Do you hear me? There is nothing that you can't ask our God for because he's willing to do it if you love him for real. For real. For we serve a God who owns all the silver. And all the gold. We serve a God that sent his son to die on the cross so that we can live a life and live it what? More abundantly. Yes. We serve a God who wants us to live in the land of more than enough and not enough. We serve a God that loves us so much that he calls us friend. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above what you can ask or think exceedingly that's all that you can ask abundantly more than you can ask or think amen hallelujah when we ask him we've planted the seed and if we believe and listen for instructions i'm confident that your it is on the way but when you ask him you gotta act like you have what you ask him for. So everybody else saw me driving a minivan. I saw me driving a convertible. You understand what I'm saying? You got to, you got to act on what you know and not what you feel. You got to act on what you know and not what you see. You got to act on what you know and not what they said. Amen. Amen. Because now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You may not see it right now, but you have it. And you must know that you already have it. You just start acting like you have it. When a seed of a man impregnates a woman she is pregnant at that moment even if she does not feel like it you know there is a tv show series about women who deliver babies and they were not aware they were pregnant Okay. <laughs> but she was pregnant even though she didn't know she was pregnant. Even though she didn't have any morning sickness, she was still pregnant. Is that right? Even if she's not showing. Oftentimes the blessing's not showing in our lives, but it's still there. Is that right? It's still there. It's still mine. You might not see it, so you might not treat me like I got it, but I got it because he said I got it. It's, I got it. I know I got it. I believe I got it. It doesn't matter if you see it or not. I just need to know. I got it. I got it. And if I believe I got it, I know our God will deliver it will deliver it, which brings me to my second point, 
which is refuse to give up. Verse 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. We will reap a harvest. We will get our it. We will get our it if we do not give up. Whatever your it is, you must not give up on it. Have you ever really worked on something really, really hard? You did everything everybody said you had to do. You tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and it still didn't work out. Have you ever been there? And so you quit. And that cabinet or gadget that you were trying to put together is still in pieces. That job that you said you wanted, you were told you were never qualified. So you accepted their plan for your life and not his plan for your life, and you gave up. You've given up because you have forgotten that promotion does not come from those clowns. Promotion comes from who? The Lord. As a matter of fact, some people on your job are trying to get you fired. So you're thinking about just quitting, beating them to the punch. But I promise you, if you hang in there, and you tell God to help you become the best employer on the planet, to do that job like nobody else can do it, I believe he will do that in your life. And even if you get fired, he's just going to give you another one. Your marriage is together, but it's severely broken. And you are just tired of trying to make the doggone thing work. So you've stopped. You've moved to another bedroom. Don't move to another bedroom. Stay in that bed. Um, let me get back to my sermon. <laughs> and Satan has convinced you that your only option is to move out or be miserable. I want to tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell. And if God can turn my marriage around to a marriage where I have lots of fun with my husband, all the time, we laugh all the time, because we've learned it ain't that serious. All right? If he can turn mine around, he can turn yours around too. Amen? Don't quit. It's worth the fight. I could go on and on and on about things we have quit because we've given up. But let me just tell you, that's just a tactic that Satan uses to make us weary and worn, to make us sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when we are weary, we can't function in the same level, at the same level, and things appear to be getting worse and worse, and as opposed to getting better and better, and our it seems further and further and further away. So much so that we find comfort in giving up. Am I telling the truth? When we get weary, we fall into Satan's plan quicker because when we are weary, we snap easier. You know, you say things like, look, I'm tired and you best Leave me alone right now. And some of y'all, you'll lay your religion down. Is that right? Because I got some things I'm going to say to you. Is that right? Is that right? Not getting our it can be so painful that instead of enduring the uncomfortable situation, instead of holding on for a little while longer, we flee from it. We're all, we already know that discomfort is a part of the process. In order for the seed to grow, it must die first. And then when it dies, then it is able to pop up. Is, are you with me? You're just being prepared to pop up. Because joy always comes in the morning. Instead of fighting for another day, we surrender and we let defeat loose. In the atmosphere, we even blame God. We say, mm, must not have been God's will. God's will is to meet your needs. God's will is your water to be on, your gas to be on. It, amen? 
God's will is not for them people to be calling you every day trying to get you to pay that bill. Is that right? That's his will. <laughs> the word says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen you. You see, in the wait, we get strong. When you get tired, it's because you haven't rested. He is told us in his word that we all need rest at some point you got to come out of the rain at some point you got to lay it down at some point you got to step away and get rest and while you're getting rest you can commune with him if we will cast our cares we can rest with the insurance that he's got it he's capable he's able and if we will only have the faith the size of a mustard seed we can look at that mountain and say, get out of the way. A prize fighter was once asked, what does it take to be a champion? And he says, you must be willing to fight one more round. We can't quit, we can't throw in the towel. Our lack of faith tells unbelievers that our God is not trustworthy, but we know that he is great. He is trustworthy, for he has never failed us yet. Is that right? There's an old song that folks sing. And it says, I will trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord until I die, until I die. And then it goes on to say, I'm going to watch. I'm going to look for it. Fight. You see, sometimes as Christians, we have to fight. We have, sometimes, don't fight unless God tells you to fight now. We have to fight as Christians because you see, just, just marching don't change nothing. Sometimes you got to fight, but he'll tell you how to fight. Is that right? See, I love the fact that we protest when something is wrong, but the reality is that ain't how you fight. You fight by telling your legislators that you're not going to take it anymore, and this is what the law that you need to be enacted. You need to fight. Fight. Then lastly, he says, I'm going to stay on the battlefield. This world that we're in is a battlefield. But guess what? If we don't leave the battlefield, we will win. If you don't leave the battlefield, you will be victorious. If you don't quit, God's got your it. And it's on the way. And the last, the last point I want to make with you is verse 10 when it says, when it says, especially do good unto all men, especially unto the household of faith. My job is, when my it comes, is that my it should produce your it. There's a pink box out there somewhere. Anybody see a pink decorated box out there anywhere? Here comes my it. Now notice, I got to come and get the it. The it just don't come to me. I got to come and get the it. Thank you. This it, he says that the only thing that, that he asked you to do is that when he bless you, that you bless other people. You see, we get a blessing. It says, shaken down, pressed down, shall men give unto my bosom. You see, I can't get blessed if you won't do your part. My it, this is my it. My it should produce other its. Is that right? And my its should be a blessing to other people. Is that right? My it should be a blessing to somebody else. My it should take me somewhere else. Is that right? My it should walk me to another location and have me invest and plant into somebody else's life. Amen? If you will, I know. I know that your it is on the way. You want to know how I know? <laughs> you want to know how I know? Because he's on the way. He's on the way. You see, they hung him high and they stretched him wide, but he's on the way. You see, they tried to mock him. They tried to pierce him in the side. They did all kind of wicked things. He could have quit. He could have come down. Is that right? But he didn't. He died for you and for me. And then they planted him in a tomb. Is that right? They planted him in a tomb, but he rose from the dead. For you and for me, is that right? So that you and I, who love him, 
could be with him in eternity. Your it is on the way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Many believe your it is on the way. Hey! My God is more than enough. He will supply all my needs. He is my El Shaddai. He always looks out for me. Jehovah Jireh. Y'all didn't know we was going to go there, did y'all? <laughs> but I believe that the Spirit of the Lord can move yeah. inside of a groove. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> say it again. Say it again. Can, can I say that again? Say it again. I believe that the Spirit of the Lord can move right inside of this groove yeah. that we in right now. So if this word has impacted you, and you're tired of it running your life and you're ready to give it and turn it over 
to the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, then I challenge you to step out. Step out on faith and make your way. Even in the midst of the group, make your way. I need a few leaders up front to receive people. Because he's moving inside the groove. Moving inside the groove. Moving inside the groove. And he's more than enough. Moving inside the groove. Moving inside the groove. Moving inside the groove. Because he's more than enough. If you need to accept Christ, just make your way up here. Come on, make your way. We're going to pray with you. If you need to accept Christ into your life, I want y'all to make room because somebody wants to give their life to Christ today. Somebody wants to hand it over to the one who supplies all your needs. So if that's you, come on up. We're waiting for you. We're going to celebrate with you. Come on. Break it down, break it down. Welcome home. We're going to pray with you. You made the best decision of your life. God wants to bless you beyond what you can even imagine. God purposed you to be here today. We love you. And he's going to prove that he's more than what you need. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. He's going to supply every one of your needs. There's not a need that you have in your life right now that he won't supply. There's not an issue that he can't handle. There's not a conversation that you can have with him that he's not already ready for. All right? Praise God. Come by, somebody celebrate. Hallelujah. Hey. Hey. All right. Is there somebody else who wants to give up their life? Hey. Is there somebody else who wants to give up their life? Come on down, come on down, come on down. This is how we do it in Macedonia. I knew it was somebody else. Hey, come on. Is there somebody else who wants to give up their life? Hey! Welcome home, my sister. 
Fiesta! God is going to make you brand new. You also made the best decision that you could have ever made. God says, welcome home. I've been calling you. I've been waiting for you. And now that you stepped out on faith, I want you to put your faith in me. And your whole life is going to change. The whole direction of your life is going to change. But not for the worse, but for the better. We are excited for you. We're happy that you're a part of the family. Welcome home, my sister. Somebody asked a question. Is there somebody? Is there somebody else that wants to give up their life? home my sister I said I don't know why the Lord led me there but you've been to some parties in your lifetime but God says there ain't no party it sounds like a cliche but he means it there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop in other words when you make the decision to give your life to Christ you receive all the Holy Ghost that you are going to need to sustain you in every aspect of your life. And so even when life doesn't look like it's, it's going your way, the Holy Ghost is still having a party on the inside. And you have everything that you need because you have the Holy Spirit to be your comforter, to be your guide. And now at this point of your life, the enemy tried to make you think, think that it was too late to give your life to Christ. But God says the best is yet to come. Hey! He says the best is yet to come. Welcome home. looking for you. Break it down, break it down, break it down. Hey, is there somebody else? Is there somebody else that wants to give up your life? Give up your life. Exchange the misery and strife. Give up your life, exchange the misery and strife, yeah. Uh. Y'all better start coming some more because I can stay here all day. All right. So what are we going to do like we've been doing? <laughs> Like we've been doing, we're going to give you one more opportunity to come, give your life so we can celebrate, and then we're going to go home. And we can put on Ice Cube. I have to say it was a good day, right? <laughs> Y'all know that song. Sometimes we, sometimes we say that when, when, the, when the Lord shows up in a mighty way, we say like Ice Cube, I have to say. Today was a good day. Ah, today was a good day. Yeah. 
Today was a good day. Today was a good day. See, when, when, when it's time to just continue that atmosphere, ain't nobody in a rush to go. And when you have kept that posture, that's when we've seen so much fruit. So we're going to make the appeal one more time for somebody to actually, who had never given your life to Christ, and you, don't, you thought today was just going to be a normal day. But you literally feel him tugging and pulling on you. This is not at all what you expected, but God says, that's good. Get used to the unexpected. He says, get used to it. So whoever you are, come on down. Come on down. If you're in the balcony, we'll wait for you. If you're under the balcony, we'll wait for you. Come on, there's one more. There's one more. Y'all hear that? Y'all hear Brother Butch? Sound like Prince. Good thing it ain't Michael, because I might, I might go somewhere where y'all be like, what's wrong with him? <laughs> Is there one more? Is there one more? I know there's one more. God says there's one more. Y'all want me to... Y'all want to go home, I know that, but there is one more. Stop running, stop hiding. Come on down. Come on down. Why don't you come on down? Stop running, stop hiding. Come on. We're going to celebrate with you. We're going to have a Holy Ghost party with you wherever you are. Come on down. Hey, hey. All right, listen. We're going to transition. Those, there were some that came down earlier who I believe just wanted to be prayed for. And so if you, if you came down because you just wanted us to believe God and, and touch and agree with you and to receive prayer, we have some leaders up front who are, who are ready to, to, to go into prayer with you as well. And we're going to make a transition. We're going to celebrate. And after the benediction, if you still feel the call, if you didn't answer the call and you still feel a call, to receive salvation even after we pray you can still come and we will receive you it's not too late it's not too late but before we pray you got an opportunity right now for us to celebrate if that shoot if that shoot did you think like man if they would have said it one more time i would have come <laughs> The time is now. Yeah. Hey. All right. Uh. Come on, let's just give God a praise for how he moved. One more time for the word of God through Minister Kathy. Let's give God praise for those who came down to give their life to Christ. New members of the kingdom of God. Let us receive this benediction. Father God, we thank you for being more than enough, God. We thank you for supplying all of our needs, God. We thank you that our cup is overflowing, God. We thank you, God, that we'll never be the same, God. We thank you that we won't be afraid to ask for anything that is within your will. And we will add our faith, believing that you will give us the desires of our hearts. We thank you, God, that this word will not fall upon deaf ears, God, but that when we leave out of this place, we will, God, put it into action, God. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. And in Jesus' name, we all say amen. 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 amen.